Good morning and welcome to the second day of SALS 21 here on the stage of AI. My name is Karin Gabriel and I have the pleasure of guiding you through today's program. Today we will explore the current and potential future impacts of AI on our society and on us individually. We'll meet corporations that have embraced an innovation mindset and learn how they are approaching the adoption of artificial intelligence. We'll discuss with artists whether AI helps or hinders us in our creative thinking and our creative expression. And we'll take a look at the risks that corporations, public sector in, uh, institutions, as well as individual households may face in the context of cybersecurity. SALS 21 is home to fantastic speakers, as well as super exciting startups. I'm not sure if you have already met a few of them. And there is a saying that goes, it takes a village to raise a child, and I think it's similar to startups. It takes a whole ecosystem to build a successful startup. And our first two speakers are a testimony to that. We have Avi Lifschitz with us today, who is the CEO of We Accelerate, and they're on a mission to build Austria's most innovative innovation ecosystem. So please join me in welcoming Avi Lifschitz. Many thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, apparently, it's too early. <laughs> um, it's, it's a learning for next time. Just don't take the first slot. Um, anyhow, thank you very much for those who are attending that are here. Um, we are, who of you are familiar with Accelerates? Raise your hands. Just one, two. OK, good. Um, Accelerate is, um, is, a, is a great project. We are located in the heart of Vienna. Um, uh, at Schwedenplatz, for those who are familiar with uh, ge geography in Vienna. Um, we have, oh, that's me, if you didn't recognize. Okay, great picture. Um, we, ha we are a, um, the heart and soul of the innovation ecosystem in Austria. Um, five years ago, as we were founded, we had um, the urge to build up a major hub where people get connected, where ideas get accelerated, where startups work work together with corporates where experts will find you know, a place and a stage to connect with other smart people. So our mission was is to create and lead Austria's most impactful innovation ecosystem. It, to be honest, at the very beginning, it was the largest, the biggest, and so on. Um, it doesn't uh, add any value, so we turned into uh, impactful. We work together today with uh, hundreds of startups. We have around 50 big corporations in our network. I'll show you some logos in, um, in the next slides. Um, a lot of experts, universities, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, back then, we, um, we identified the major problem. We are living an, in an ever accelerating era of innovation, right? Things are speeding up enormously. If you look at you know, the, um, the buzz that ChatGPT created over the last weeks, right? And now every corporate bookkeeper knows about ChatGPT, right? That wouldn't have been the case a couple of months ago. So we're living in a very fast path of acceleration, of innovation. And um, there is a study that says 76% um, of those who were questioned here, the 1,500 people in charge, executives, uh, say that their business model is going to be significantly different in the next five years. No matter if you're a corporate, a startup, whatever you do, in five years, you're going to do things differently. Now, obviously, if you're a financial institution, you'll probably be uh, that again in five years as well, if you're not in Silicon Valley. Um, uh, if you are you know, a manufacturing company, you'll probably be that in five years as well. right? Um, but the way you're going to sell your product, wrap your product, um, um, address your clients, go into cooperation with others to make a more attractive product is going to be significantly different. 76% believe that's going to come to life. Now, 84% um, of the same study, this is an Accenture study just for three months ago, 84% um, of the same study say, um, if that's the case, the solution must be 
uh, created via an ecosystem. Okay, and we'll address the word ecosystem in a second. Um, but in the same study, only 10% admit that, they, I don't know if you see it because of the chair, but um, only 10% only admit that not even 5% of the revenue is today derived from an ecosystem approach. Okay, so you sense we're in the beginning of an era of ecosystem innovations. And this is where we come along. Um, but I said the word, the word ecosystem quite a few times until now. Let's talk about what it is. Uh, what is our understanding of an ecosystem? I think it's a little bit kind of a buzzword, right? Everybody says an ecosystem, it's more like it's, it's something that one has to have or has to enter or uh, in need of. Um, so let's discuss what ecosystem is really about. Now we did our, our homework and we come up with um, four common types of an ecosystem, okay? Every ecosystem has a value. Let's just work it uh, from left to right. An industry ecosystem, it's more of a buzzword, right? It's more of a marketing term. Uh, it's like saying uh, we have the ecosystem of Munich, or for that case, of Salzburg. Um, uh, it's nothing more than, you know, making it sound more s uh, sexy. It has no real value behind it. Just, you know, I'm part of that ecosystem. Cool, I'm feeling better now. But there is no real value behind it. Um, in the ecosystem of knowledge, it's um, more about exchanging. So when, when you talk about a knowledge exchange, it's creating formats that allow people to interact with each other and exchange knowledge. There are several um, uh, platforms for that. We would understand, we say it also as, um, as, as one that supports knowledge ecosystem. Platform ecosystem, you're definitely familiar with that. Airbnb, Amazon, and a thousand other uh, Amazon, um, platforms that provide value um, according to a uh, marketplace uh, dynamics. And an innovation ecosystem is a newer term, a, a, a more complicated term, is where you have to align multiple players to achieve a greater good, to achieve a better product, a more cost-effective product, and so on. Um, there are a couple examples. I'll bring you one suite um, in, in a second. This is uh, Wixarit's ecosystem. In, um, we are right qu quick as a we are rather focused on the Austrian market. You see many players. You'll probably be familiar with with uh, with many of them. And um, again, in the inner circle, this is we have a major hub in Vienna, 9,000 square meters, around 40 companies. Um, can call it their headquarter, and uh, the logos is uh, just right here. It most important to say is. An ecosystem consists of three main values. Um, on the one hand, the number of participants. Okay, so two people are not an ecosystem, right? Um, on the second pillar is how, div how diverse they are, okay? A bad example if, is if all banking people meet up, right? They're not an ecosystem, right? They need to be diverse. And a third pillar is how well they are connected. Okay, so how well can you create those connections? Just imagine going to a party, you know everybody's cool there, right? But you don't know anybody, and nobody helps you get aligned. So you need to, be s to have smart connections between those players. And this is what we do at Wixerit. Let me give you an example of a, s a sweet story about how ecosystem of innovation works. Um, this is a, um, a sole and shoe inlay, and uh, Adidas had the great idea to um, um, to um, print them in 3D printers in shops. So you as a client would go there, you would, they would scan your, your, your feet, um, and they would do 3D printing on site uh, to give you the best shoes experience ever, okay? So they had this idea, it's quite neat. They went off and invested around 200 million euro to do so. So they hired people who understand how, you know, physicians with speciality of how to scan the feet to adapt. They hired 3D, 3D printing people. They bought machines and so on and so forth. A lot of money went into that. Complicated story, okay? Same time, this guy in here, uh, in this flat, and this is a true, a true picture, um, invented, had the same idea, but he did not have uh, 200 million euros right, to invest. Um, so he did something way smarter. 
he aligns partners alongside that idea. Okay, so he went off and talked to the to retail people. He talked to 3D printing people. He um, support, got supported from clinics and so on and so forth. He invested 100 so, one, uh, so three, around 3 million euro to get that um, same product built up. Okay, sweet happy end of the story is Adidas bought his solution because they didn't get it to fly, okay? Um, this is, uh, by the way, Professor Lingens who brought up that example from University of St. Gallen. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, this is exactly a, a, a very quick and uh, sweet idea of what we do. We align all those various players, the corporates, uh, public, um, startups, venture capital, and academia. We connect the dots smartly to create a superior value. Make sense so far? Okay. Um, when, when, when we talk to, to partners, when we talk to companies that do not know us, they ask us, okay, so why, what's, what's the value for me? Why would I need to do that? And I told you before, 76% believe in five years going to be to a totally different business than you do it today. Uh, and um, to become that uh, superhero in five years, you will need four advantages that I'll tell you right now. Um, obviously, way forward is going via experiments, right? So if you need to do some things different in five years, you're going to have to try a couple of, couple of things, and guess what? Not every try will be a success, right? So it has to be cost effective. So you need to go somewhere or to connect with people who will help you to have more cost effective experiments. You have to have resources, access to resources that you today do not have. So if you are into 3D printing, and obviously you know your uh, manpower does not have the skill today, you have the option to go and try to hire. Now you know how difficult that is nowadays. Um, or you, you need to go somewhere where you will find those people. This is access to resources, to people that you do not have today. Um, same goes for new collaborations. Now, if I'm interested in collaborating to create new products and services, where do I meet people, corporations, startups that are also looking for people to collaborate? I need to go somewhere, right? So, uh, new collaboration partners is something that you can meet in a good working ecosystem, and obviously, inspiration uh, of new for uh, of new business models and business ideas. Thank you very much. It was a quick one. Thank you, Avi, for the introduction. So, Avi's got. You can. Uh, uh, Thank you, okay. Yes, I'm going to ask you to come back on stage in a minute. Um, we have seen that the innovation ecosystem consists of different partners, of course, corporates, public sector institutions, who are often also regulators, academia, and so on. And a very, very important key component of any innovation star uh, ecosystem are startups because they are the ones who usually are the source of new technology, of new business model, as we have seen it in the example of Adidas. And to, get us, to give us an understanding of what it means to build and grow a startup, I now have the honor to invite Pavel Cech to us on stage. Pavel is the co-founder of New Native AI, which started out as an idea, then became an accelerator, turned into a community, and is now a startup that is opening businesses and uh, offices around the world. They are originally out of Sweden and have recently moved to Silicon Valley, opened their first office in the US. So Pavel, I'm curious to hear your story of new native AI. Welcome to Salz21. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, great to be in Salzburg. Uh, it's, it's lovely. Thank you very much, um, everybody, to, for hosting us. Um, so I'm going to show you a few videos <laughs> to start off with, and that's going to introduce the story. And then um, I'll tell you, um, as in the meme, from how it started to how's it going, right? So we're going to go a little bit backwards. Um, when we first started, it was 2019. We opened up an accelerator uh, program for um, artificial intelligence companies. So we only were interested in AI. We understood uh, where, I, where AI is going and how powerful um, that technology will become. And um, so we focused uh, exclusively on that thing, right? So if you do 
one thing very, very well, ideally the best in the world, um, then you can really um, achieve great things. So New Native is building the AI economy, and this is the way that we're doing it. So in 2019, we started, and you can play the video. Um, to the next one so the next slide um, so this is 2019 right we organized something that's called deep learning labs we started by inviting people it was first 50 people that were, super excited. Arbeit. They were super excited about AI and then um, it went to uh, to and let's wait for this um, so and then it went for uh, seven months, right? Each month we had a meetup, and then it ended up with 150 people, 200, 250 people. It started to get too big. It was all PhDs, people coming from JP Morgan Chase, from Samsung, from you know the top uh, banks uh, and uh, from the top financial institutions, top corporations, university students, professors, uh, everybody, right? Everybody wanted to do something. Everybody wanted to build, right? So we said, okay, we need to take this to the next level and we started to accelerate the best projects, right? And um, our accelerator was called NextGrid. It's still, you know, you can find it. It's nextgrid.ai, and it's ranked as the top 10 global AI accelerators, uh, and it was built fully bootstrapped, and it was built in a year. Um, so um, this was the next year, 2022. So uh, anybody remember what happened in 2020? Uh, sorry, 2020, COVID hit, right? So this is just at the beginning of COVID. Let's play it. I'll show you how it went. Let's go back to the slides. So as you see, uh, it grew very quickly, and we learned how to make better videos. Um, so <laughs> there was progress all over. Um, we, had, um, um, we had this idea that what we should do is we should build a whole process, right? And that process should take us from ideification, from prototyping, to rapid market feedback, to acceleration. Um, and we developed um, a system. Um, so when the pandemic hit, we built an online platform that could replicate this process, and it's called lablab.ai. So lablab effectively aggregates talents and generates uh, proof of concepts in artificial intelligence. And it's a 
continuous way to basically innovate, right? So very rapidly innovate. And in Slingshot, we provide an exoskeleton of services for products and startups to go to market at scale. And then in NextGrid, we accelerate the startups towards financing and funding and invest in them. Um, so to talk to you a little bit about artificial intelligence value integration, right? So you get a sense of what is needed to take an AI company to market, right? So on the bottom layer, you have something that's called um, foundation models. And you know these models, yeah, chat, GPT, GPT-3. But there's also a 100 other model providers that specialize in specific things. And we work with the best companies in the world on this. So Cohere, Stability, um, AI, that's behind Stable Diffusion. If you ever generated an AI cat, that's the model behind it. And um, AI21 Labs. And now even more and more uh, new companies coming in. So these foundation models, uh, they create the layer where you can play around, right? But they're so powerful that you can actually then start to create very specific AI models. So you can hyper-tune them. You can add parameters. You can add your own data. I know this is boring, but I'll be quick. And <laughs> then you have something that's called uh, local AI models. So you have additional local training, or you run them locally, or you use an open source model to replicate the functionality of the foundation model. And to take that to market, what you see, what uh, everybody plays around with or uses as a productivity tool is an operating layer and an API layer and then an application layer, right? So our company um, takes foundation models from the world's biggest providers, the best AI labs in the world, and also open source and from individual creators, and it takes those models to market in that process from prototype to incubation to acceleration. Um, so <coughs> today, 2023, fast forward, we run uh, one of the largest AI makers communities in the world. Our platform Lab Lab uh, has now, not 32, that's a mistake, there's 40,000 users already in just seven months. And we created 650 projects in that seven months. Um, and we aggregate the global AI builders into uh, the world's biggest um, generative AI community. Um, and there's a video here that should play. Yeah. Oh. But we don't need that. Um, so how have we become the number one place to build with AI? Um, you can take out your phone right now. I won't be mad. Google AI Hackathon. Google AI Stream. Google um, Generative AI Hackathon. Google GPT-3 Hackathon. GPT Chat, Stability, Cohere. AI21, Google anything that is connected with creating AI, and LabLab Lab will be the number one result in the world, right? From Salzburg to Japan to Chile to Silicon Valley, it's the number one place where people come to build with um, AI. And uh, we work with some of the global um, top technology uh, giants as well, like Amazon, uh, Google, um, Redis, uh, Quadrant, yeah, so a bunch of very, very high-level companies. Um, so why I'm talking to you about this? Why, sh why should you care, right? This is all fun and games, but why should you care? Um, this year is going to be the year of the AI builder. Your day-to-day um, -day and everybody's day-to-day -day is going to get severely disrupted by introduction of very advanced artificial intelligence solutions. And you can go to lablab.ai and basically browse 650 of these solutions and check out whether um, they are from healthcare or they're from manufacturing or industry or uh, games um, and basically uh, pick out what you, what you want. But just for you to know, um, time it took for uh, the first, I would say, global a um, AI uh, product to uh, reach a million users was just five days. So that's staggering. And we know that it goes into hundreds of millions today. Um, so just to summarize what we do, so from ideification to proof of concept to pre-seed and seed, and that's where our ecosystem uh, stops. So we uh, stimulate grassroot level development and grassroot level involvement. So if you want to build an AI company, you should come and build it with us. Um, also in Salzburg, right? And anywhere else in the world. Um, and uh, then we work with local partners um, and with local uh, ecosystems to 
help these companies grow further, get additional capital, go to market. But we specialize in that very early stage from ideification to seed. Um, so this is how's it going right now. Um, that's the last video. So last event, two weeks ago, seven and a half thousand people from all around the world joined. We have around 7,000 people today with us. Artificial intelligence is one of the best and most powerful technologies that can do good for the world. An AI tutor for children. A personalized storybook generator. The power for AI assistant digital art content creation tool. An app where students can have a conversation with the historical figures they used to study in books. The all-in-one AI powered tool that simplifies your daily life tasks. The winner team is the team which created an application called Mars Mail. Congratulations guys! So um, you can all can go to the presentation. Um, so you can all join a hack at lablab.ai and build your AI prototype, product, and potentially company. We actually are running an event here even in Salzburg. Uh, so you probably didn't know, but we have about 600 people from Salzburg that joined uh, the hackathon online. Um, we will be having the finals today, um, later. I think it's like 3.30 or... 5, 5 p.m. So we're going to have, on this stage, we're going to have finalists. Where there's going to be four companies. I think it's 25 people <laughs> that are coming to pitch their best ideas. And together, we're going to choose the finalists and accept them into an accelerator program here in Salzburg. So they're going to get accelerated here in Salzburg. They're going to start building their company. And just to give you a perspective, these are people that did not know each other. We put together, we created the teams around them, we gave them the technology. This happened six days ago. And on day seven, they have the opportunity to create the next uh, AI company out of Salzburg. And that's the rate of AI innovation that, I'm, uh, that I want to leave you uh, with. Um, yeah, so we're new native, we're building the AI economy and it will be great to continue this conversation. Thank you, Pavel. And Avi, if I can ask you to join us as well. So um, before we start, who of you here is an entrepreneur or works in a startup? I think one, a few, OK. Who is a student? There's four. There's <laughs> five. Um, anybody working in the uh, private sector, private sector companies? Yeah? Public sector as well? OK, interesting. Um, Thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, Avi, the idea of an innovation startup where you have different players, academia, public, private, startups, it sounds like a lot of fun. People from different backgrounds get together, but tell me, what are the biggest challenges? Because I assume that while there is an intention there to collaborate, maybe the bureaucracy or the cultures do not always match to actually work together. So what have been the biggest challenges for you building and running an innovation ecosystem? Um, that's a multidimensional question, yeah. obviously. <laughs> um, we have, I'll, I'll share two thoughts, if mm -hmm. you agree. Um, on the one hand, um, I don't think culture is the, is the main issue okay. nowadays. As, but when we started off five years ago, um, Although many were in love with the idea of uh, having startups and collaborating with them and becoming way smarter the way they do business, it, uh, the organization, most organizations were not ready to do so. Okay? So it's not, even not, not only a mindset, but on s only, uh, also processes, also you know, the purchasing department and the uh, regulation department and, uh, and so on and so forth. They would needed to be provided with input as well to cope with cooperation, with collaborations when it comes to AI or other kind of tech startups. So there was a lot of work needed on, on cooperation side uh, to be, to, to be capable, capable to do so. On the second, and, and the second thought is we're living, as I said before, in a very fast lane of change 
everywhere. And also innovation industry is evolving very, very fast. New topics come along. These kind of solutions were not even on the radar a couple of months ago, right? And all of a sudden, all corporates are like, yeah, definitely AI is the future. Let's embrace it, right? So this is a new thought that just came up within the last weeks. Um, so as a service provider, this is how we define ourselves, is obviously also a challenge to keep up, right? And uh, becoming, um, uh, becoming the coordinator, the one who connects the, uh, the dots in a smart way in an industry that, that evolves so fast. Okay, so we need to be very smart and you know, to have everything on our radar to react and to provide the services and the connections that corporates and other players are willing to, um, to uh, invest in. And so if I'm a corporate, what is the best way for me to prepare to join such an ecosystem? And also, who should drive this engagement? Should it be from the top? Should there be a specific department? I know quite a few corporations are setting up their own innovation departments. And by the way, later this afternoon, we'll have the innovation leads of Spa and Palfinger with us today as well. And they're going to share how easy or the not so easy it was to build it up. But which department should lead that engagement? Yeah, well, b um, both corporates are working with Accelerate, so this is already a very good start. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, um, it's, it's definitely a, um, a strategic, strategic decision, mm -hmm. so it's not a bottom-up approach. It must be top-down. If the CEO or decision makers are not buying into the idea of we need to become a little bit smarter when it comes to usage of technology, then it's going to fail. Mm -hmm. Because you need uh, resources, usually corporates will go also into exploration exercises where people and resources will be aligned with exploring new business ideas. Uh, and if this is not sanctioned from uh, the top, it's not going to fly. Yeah, fantastic. And one question I have for you as well, because you, do, you did mention in the introduction that you want to build the most impactful innovation ecosystem in Austria. How do you measure the impact? And also, how do you, especially on a corporate side as well, right? If I put in money in the end, I need to showcase some indicators that make the top level understand the outcome of it or the, the return on investment. But how do you measure as well your own success? Well, uh, oh, this is a very tricky question because relevance is in the eye of the observer, mm -hmm. right? I mean, for everybody, would be it would be a different uh, assessment to what impactful means. However, um, we want to go away from innovation as a buzzword, yeah. as a marketing vehicle to um, retain talents, to, you know, to make just a good press conference. Uh, this is not where we want to be. Uh, when it comes to innovation and to acceleration, we uh, believe that an impactful um, I impactfulness will be created by creating new businesses and services. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, obviously, this is not a, you know, a from one day to another business. You'll have to let it evolve. But um, we see, especially uh, Pathfinger is a great example. Uh, with Pathfinger 21st, you might hear it late afternoon. They've launched with us also a, uh, an incubator, and they've got a great idea with drones um, that they uh, realized. So this is really awesome. This is where impactfulness come into place. They change from manufacturer to a service provider. This is a major transition uh, behind it, and this is exactly uh, what it looks like. Fantastic. Thank you. And, and then you, Pavel, are kind of, in a way, connecting strangers from all over the world. Um, forcing them to work together through a hackathon, which is usually how many days? Um, yeah, they want to do it, hopefully. We're, <laughs> yeah. not, we're not forcing them. Uh, it's between 48 hours and seven days right now. So not really a lot of time. And then they present, um, you identify the most promising ideas, and then, of course, you help them as well be part of an ecosystem so that they can further continue their growth. Um, I'm just curious, because you have ha you had so many individual members that joined your hackathons. What is their motivation and where do they come from? Are those predominantly students? Are those people who already work in the professional career and what domain? But what drives them and where do they come from? Um, so where do they come from, first of all? So um, they come from uh, large corporates, that's mm -hmm. for sure. Okay. So there's a big grassroots movement in large corporates. Um, because people want to use AI technologies because they see them kind of interact with their day-to-day. -day. 
and then they're waiting for the top-down decision sometimes, and it might come, it might not come, it might impact them, might it might not impact them. So um, they just want to explore new technologies. And the people that are coming um, usually um, are coming from very uh, high-level executive positions, right, in the um, development side of the um, of those businesses. Mm -hmm. um, so whether it's people from Meta, the parent company of Facebook, or we uh, have people like that manage the MIT Innovation Fund, uh, coming from uh, big banks, right, as well. Um, I think a lot of people from um, from large uh, manufacturing companies as well are coming. A lot of engineers are coming, right. And, and these are very high quality, high level people. Um, and um, we also get students, obviously, but we get people that are on the Forbes uh, 30 under 30, uh, or uh, if we get students, uh, the last second place winners was uh, Forbes 100 best uh, teenagers in the world, right? So we get, we get people like that, right? Um, and I think what motivates them is uh, curiosity because they need to find it first, right? So it's not it's organic, right? They need to they need to search for this first. So they need to be interested. And when they're interested, they find us, and that's where we tell them it's it's great, it's okay that you're interested. It's actually good. We can actually help you one when you're already interested, and this is what you do, right? So we take them by um, by the hand and and guide them through a process, right? So. Um, it feels almost like they found their tribe, right? They found their, their village, right? In that uh, ecosystem. Because the other people that are there, they're there because of the exact same reasons, right? So if you're gonna talk to somebody, you're gonna find people that are similarly motivated, they have similar backgrounds, but they come from different uh, subject matter expertise, mm -hmm. or they have different technical expertise, right? And what we found on the corporate level is corporates, in, in a lot of cases, they try to take four data scientists or PhDs, they stick them in the room, and they lock the door, and they say, innovate. And <laughs> now. In this boardroom. <laughs> yes. And then they come back in a month and say, where's the innovation, guys? And they said, well, I mean, we made this cogwheel go faster <laughs> using AI. It's going super fast now, right? And, and it's AI. So that's not really innovation. So understanding the dynamic behind um, creativity, right? The team dynamic, the capability dynamic. That is uh, uh, the secret sauce, let's say, right? And, and um, yeah, I think uh, people coming from all over the world, they get motivated by the same thing or similar things. Um, and then in the end, what really motivates them is I've the, um, they want to have a positive impact on the world and they want to see something build that works uh, quickly, yeah? Because <laughs> we're, we're used to now everything being, you know, instant delivery, so they want that. And yeah, I think that's what they, they, they crave. And in the end, um, to finish such a project is actually very difficult. Mm. So it's not easy to finish such a project. It's easy to sign up or it's easy to, you know, you have to be curious and to find it. But to finish it, to submit, to record uh, a pitch video, which we will all see in, in at 5 p.m., that requires a different kind of motivation, mentality. Yeah? So very, very special people. Do you have a percentage of how many people throw in the kickoff call and how many are still on the yeah, when you know yeah. that the winners there, get announced? There's a big drop-off, obviously. Yeah. Right? There's a big drop-off. Um, but people fail, mm -hmm. and then they come back. Okay, and then yeah. they try again. So, like some of the best people uh, that we have, and it's, and it's also very, very important to say to young and, and everybody else, to young people and everybody else, it's okay to fail. This is difficult technology. It's difficult to innovate. It's okay to fail. There's no real cost associated other than your, um, uh, your, your time and your effort and so on, but you're learning every minute of the way, right? So in the end, you gain expertise, you gain knowledge, you gain experience. And it's fine if it doesn't work, just come back and try again. Mm -hmm. Get a different team. Yeah, Get people from your local uh, university or go uh, back to your company, to your corporate and take four buddies and, and basically four people and stick them in a room and then you innovate but you use uh, the technologies that we provide them, right? So I think that's, um, in the end, it's very, very difficult to, to finish. Um, 
I think it's about 27% mm -hmm. of, the, of the people that uh, in the end they submit, right? Uh, which is, I think, super high percentage. Yeah. <laughs> and then obviously a very small percentage of those people will come to build successful startups, right? But um, you have to start. Yeah. If you're not going to start, you're not going to be able to build a successful company. And you did mention that, I mean, it's very obvious if um, I'm already working in the tech department or tech space, that this is a great place for me to also enhance my skills to, you know, sh uh, exchange with peers. But what about someone who has zero technical backgrounds in the sense that we all know about ChatGPT now even four, which was launched yesterday, um, but maybe we haven't even used it yet, you know, I haven't, I've read about it in news. Is this something for me to join as well? Am I eligible? Like, how, how does that work if I'm interested, but I, I lack the expertise in that field? Um, so if you're motivated, yeah. it's totally for you. Yeah. The people, we have people that have zero technical background. Uh, we actually create on Lab Lab tech pages for each new technology. So we get full tutoring, onboarding onto the technology, boilerplates, templates. So it means that you get a ready-made pack that you can start with. And then um, it's a community, right? So right now it's, uh, it's uh, tens of thousands of people active uh, on Discord, right? We use Discord for that. And um, you can ask, you can go and ask, you can find a person that will teach you um, the technical skills and uh, then go through the tutorials and understand how these technologies work. So again, not easy, it's not one day fix, right? But if you're motivated and you don't have a technical skill, Today, this technology allows you to be extremely creative. It allows you to enter into a digital space um, in, in, a, in a way that was never possible before. This whole layer, uh, you know, these coding languages and, and this whole layer of communication between humans and machines, um, very modern state-of-the-art AI technologies, they remove that layer. So you need to then understand how that AI works mm -hmm. You don't need to build the AI. Just understand how to use it. And then you can actually produce your um, uh, technical innovation, even if you don't have a technical expertise. And I know that one of the criterion of the um, you know, evaluation is also the presentation, because every team of has to, of course, present. And storytelling is a key factor. And uh, not to discredit anyone, but I've worked with quite a few CTOs as well, and sometimes storytelling is not their strength because they, <laughs> they use um, very specific words that are only known to the inner circle. So I think, you know, even if you're coming from a creative background, this is uh, a great place for you to, to be. Uh, completely, yes. Yeah. If, if you know how to tell a story, if you know how to lead a team, mm. uh, if you know how to design something beautiful, or if you know how to... Um, how to do a marketing campaign, Think whatever. The business model. Yeah, yeah. you can design the business model. So these are teams between, you know, sometimes it's solo, solo riders, we call them, <laughs> and, and they, they, they do really good stuff. Uh, but the best results come with, and it's, it's six people, six different time zones, six different backgrounds, and they work asynchronously, and they get a product ready, and that's like super, super good. And then the other one is like a group of friends just joining and, and working it out, yeah? So that's also super cool. But sometimes there's only one or two technical people yeah. in a team, and they can still create something super awesome. With the support of everyone else. Then. Great. Uh, do we have any questions from you, the audience? Yes. I see a hand go up in the back. And if you could also please introduce yourself and then state your question. The mic is coming away. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you. My name is Emmanuel. Um, actually, I came here because I participated in the OpenAI Hackathon, and I figured out about, well, I saw the SALS 21 Hackathon, so I travel here. I'm not from here to see all of this. And like seeing that like there's a large like group of people, sk skilled people, participating in these type of hackathons. For example, I just graduated. I'm a physicist. I don't really like do that much like software. But and I created a team of students because I would like like everybody like not like years of experience to be able to like participate. So like, what advice do you give to like people who do not have like the same amount of experience to l be as successful? Like, I'm not saying like lack of experience is an excuse not to be successful, but it is hard to compete like 
if you are like competing against the type of people you mentioned, also participate in the hackathons? So, um, yeah, um, first of all, I'd love to talk to you later. Great <laughs> that you're here, awesome, <laughs> like man, uh, how come? Um, uh, secondly, um, communication, right? So you need to be very clear in communication uh, in the team about what are your levels, what's your expectations, right? Because uh, if you set that in the very early stage and you say, hey guys, we do not have experience, right? What powers that does, does that give us, right? So what, uh, does that mean that we have no prejudice or maybe we have no bias or maybe we have no, um, we don't have a, a set way of thinking and we can actually um, create something uh, that is better that way, right? Um, but that said, um, I think you're, you have to be super, super smart. You're a physicist, yeah? Uh, so you can, you can figure that out. Um, but the reality is that uh, there's only one winner in the end, right? So in the end, uh, you're competing against some of the best people in the world every day. And if you want to play on that level, you need to bring that level, right? So uh, put time in it and, and put effort in it and, uh, and be the best in the world at what you do. And then you are going to... Uh, compete and, and win. So um, I would say that communication, number one, yeah, and then um, only the, the best people actually make it. So we're curious to see who's going to be the winner then after the Science 21 hackathon that gets announced today at, at 5.30 here on stage. Do we have any other question? Yes, here. Well, thank you. Uh, I've been teaching AI since more than 30 years. And suddenly, in the last year or two, we are in this situation where we don't know what to teach because we're teaching people the, the basics. The, the level that Pavel said is just no gone, basically. But someone has to <laughs> understand what's inside, right? We are in a situation like, you know, the TV users or phone users. We know how to push the buttons and then combine that. But there are still fundamental problems <laughs> that we would like to solve. So, what should we teach from your point of view? You, you, you say, okay, the PhDs are coming. We are training these PhDs. And of course, uh, should we just train them to make new applications because we have the foundational models, which is fantastic. The, the, there's an emergence of different level of AI because of these models, right? And so people can do a lot of things without understanding what happens beneath. <laughs> It's, it's a real dilemma for people who teach AI. Uh, what should we teach students, especially when it's the first course, and then we have later more advanced uh, machine learning courses? <laughs> but from the point of view of yours... Uh, it, it sounds like the problem of, uh, you know, do you like to teach to manufacture a car, or do you need drivers, right? So knowing right. how to drive. Right, right. Obviously, a big proportion of world population should know how to drive, but very less people should know how to actually build a car, right? <laughs> so this would be the analogy that I would see there. I don't know, do you see it differently? Um, no, I, I actually agree with you. And uh, to your point, to your point, obviously we're talking about AI transformers, right? So that's a very tiny slit, right? It's a very tiny fraction of the total um, AI industry, right? So neural networks and, and, and so on. Um, and to even be able to think about designing new things. Like, uh, we know that the cycle of designing new technologies, the, the base layer technologies, right? Transformers were released in 2016, right? With a paper that's called Attention is All You Need, which I encourage everybody to read. It's a fascinating 80-page read. Um, uh, not joking, it's really good. Uh, so anyway, so the point is that um, people need to write those research papers, right? Now. The reality is that the, um, the number one AI research organization on the planet today is Google, right? They put 25 or 30 percent of all of the research papers in the world. I think they're, if I'm not mistaken, don't quote me, but they publish it, right? So then you have that, that element of, okay, um, th th those people are there, are there, they're writing the research papers, they're doing that, but not necessarily at the university, right? So the question is, how much money should the university get, <laughs> right? And it should get a lot more money to attract the top level people and that would result in you being very happy because they would do research in new advanced fields of AI. 
and they would publish those papers and uh, yeah and we would have a new generation of people building AI so that's that's how we should do it that, that would be great but the universities are not going to do it that's the problem <laughs> <laughs> you don't know maybe you don't know well, I think what has become very obvious from our conversation as well as from the conversations in la yesterday is that especially because AI is so fast moving and affects all of assets of our life, we need to, is we need to break down the silos, which you are doing through so we accelerate and connect different institutions. And then what you are doing, Pavel, as well, simply connect individuals that you, you know, have the same drive and have different cap competences to work together on another project. Uh, on one problem, which I think is very exciting. I think that's then when it comes down to the human level, we are so used to working, you know, if you're working in a bank and we work, let's say, in the IT department, this is where we work and nowhere else. And we might work there for the next, I don't know, 15, 20 years, but this is now all being changed thanks to AI as well. And it's great to see how quickly or, or new organizations uh, and models are coming up, such as Reaccelerator and New Native AI. Thanks a lot, Avi and Pavel, for uh, this talk. Um, and I said 5.30 is when we're going to announce the winning teams of the hackathon at SALS21, who have been working on it for four days. And at 12.30, we have the conversation with the innovation leads of Spa and Palfinger, which also the Accelerator was involved. And the next talk is going to happen at 10.30 with Carl Hayden Smith uh, on regenerative technology for hyperhuman adaption. So stay tuned, we're going to continue in a few minutes. Thank you.